Hello and welcome back to the F2 Show. I'm your host, Fraser Ford, and I'm joined today by Inside F2 editor, Hannah Prufuk, uh, GP Grandstand's Jim Kimberley, and we have a special guest today. Our special guest is Jack Aitken, Williams Formula One reserve driver and HWA Formula Two driver. Coming up on today's show, we look ahead to Silverstone as motorsport is set to come home, unless at least something's going to. Uh, our panel discuss who uh, are the drivers and teams to watch out for this weekend. And we ask your questions to Jack and the rest of the panel. And I'm sorry for the for the Euros uh, comment, guys. I, I'm, I'm still struggling to get over the, uh, the result. It was uh, a tough blow. But Jack, I want to start with you. Uh, back in Formula 2 this season, uh, was it a surprise when you got the call? And, and how much have you enjoyed being back on the grid this season? It was a little bit of a surprise. Um, I know the the team. Uh, I think it's team manager there. There's so many different way. Team principal, team manager. I don't don't know what the difference is between all of them. Anyway, <laughs> I, I know him from a long time ago when we were racing at Arden in GP3, and we we're still quite good friends. And they had a bit of a situation with one of their drivers. And um, they wanted someone with experience to come in and give them a bit of feedback on the car as well. So that's been um, a nice, uh, I, I definitely wasn't expecting to do it. And um, to do Monaco, Baku and Silverstone, uh, probably the three best tracks I could have picked. So um, pretty happy just to be able to go and run. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you assess the season so far, both obviously Formula 2 season and also GT season as well? They, those cars are really fun to drive. Yeah, they're mega. I mean, um, it's been something really different, which is quite refreshing because, um, I mean, the Formula 2 is super impressive car to drive, obviously. Um, but I've been in that paddock um, because GP3 and F2, same paddock, basically, for the last five years. And um, I know everybody there really well. Uh, it's very, it's a, you know, a whole a community of familiar faces and it's quite tight knit. Uh, and it's the same format every weekend. And it's just nice to do something different and something where I don't really know any of the drivers. I don't really know the teams. Um, I'm even messing up um, like my timetables because I'm like getting confused between sprint format and endurance format and six hour races and 24 hour races with different rules and it's uh it's been a steep learning curve but uh the pace has been good which is always nice it's just learning how to deal with all the other stuff that's pretty new for me yeah good and and jim obviously great to have you back with us back who last time out is pretty exciting wasn't it obviously championship leader guan yu Zhou only picked up 10 points uh which has blown the title uh open a little bit it, i mean the championship battle is on now isn't it yeah, it is. And it just seems like so long ago at this point, this new calendar is just really uh, having massive gaps between all the races. So yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit wild how much of a, how many months it's been. Is it six weeks since we were at Baku? It's just, it's bonkers, isn't it? So yeah, it's great. The championship fight well and truly on and having more victors again and having Robert Schwartzman turn up after a bit of a, disappointing start it's yeah it's it's anybody's and joe really needs to clench his fist on how he started the season if he wants to really look into pursuing the title this year and i think he really needs to get the title this year he's in a strong position but yeah we're i'm really excited potentially with vips as well uh rocketing up with great performance and we're halfway through the season and I couldn't tell you who is going to win it. I couldn't predict you. I couldn't even predict the top five at this point in any order. It's just so wild as uh, Formula 2 so often is. But really exciting. Silverstone, we've got three races that could be hugely influential in the championship. So any of these drivers get a zero points weekend. That could make everything topsy-turvy. So I'm just so excited to see Formula 2 back and not having a clue on what's going to happen. Yeah, it really is. It's classic Formula 2 this season, and it? Absolutely crazy. And Hannah, obviously, great to have you back with us again. Uh, Baku was a little bit of a game-changing weekend. Jim's just mentioned it. Robert Schwartzman uh, and Yuri Vips obviously throwing themselves into the mix as well. You know, how, how important is that for those guys? I think it's majorly important for, okay, for the morale as well, I think, for a lot of the drivers, especially, for example, Robert Schwartzman. A lot of us predicted he was going to have a strong season from the outset considering his pace last year. And unfortunately, sometimes things didn't work out for them. And heading into Silverstone, we saw last year, Silverstone made or 
broke a lot of drivers' championship potential that time around. And it'll be halfway through the season. So for them, it's kind of difficult to build up momentum. I think, obviously, you've said it's been six weeks since the last race. Building that momentum is going to be crucial heading into the rest of the season. And I'm excited to see kind of how much the championship fight narrows. I think if a couple of drivers have a, some good performances, they could possibly push themselves into title contention. So I think we're going to be set for another amazing weekend at Silverstone. Yeah, it's going to be really good. I definitely can't wait. Let's take a look at the championship standings then after round three. Guan Yu Zhou tops the standings with 78 points after three rounds, but is really close at the top. Oscar Piastri closing the gap to just five points. As we've already mentioned, strong weekends from Robert Schwartzman and Yuri Vips push them into championship contention. They're followed by Dan Tictum and Teo Porsche. And the team standings. Kramer are now top of the team standings after a total of three podiums in Baku. They leapfrogged UNI Virtuosi, who uh, dropped to second in the standings, and they're just six points ahead of High Tech and Carlin. If you want to see the full standings, head over to www.insidef2.com. Jack, I want to get your take on the, on the championship battles so far. Who, who's impressed you the most this season? I think, like you said, it's been um, really open, classic F2, but even uh, more so this year with the extra reverse grid race. I mean, it's something that I noticed when I came back um, that I think for uh, somebody who's contending for the championship, it's quite a tricky format because it really doesn't favour you, actually. And it's very easy to get caught up in, in accidents in the first sprint race and that can really derail things. So I think, you know, Guan Yu's been fairly consistent uh, without setting the world on fire. Um, I mean, not, not the best round last time out, but he's usually been in the mix of that top um, 10 and always safe in that um, that reverse grid bubble. Otherwise, um, I think it was pretty impressive what Porsche did in Monaco. Obviously, is he is he racing this, this weekend at yes, Silverstone? He is. Has he yeah. recovered? Yeah. He has, okay. All right. So that's good. But um, yeah, he did a really good job there, I think, and showed pretty good pace even if he's maybe not quite as consistent as some of the other guys and has had a few spills here and there um and yeah i mean there's probably more guys i'm surprised that um who have underperformed or have had a lot of bad luck or accidents um it seems like there's been quite a few casualties this year um maybe partly because of that new format yeah, it's been really interesting, isn't it? And Hannah, you know, Silverstone is such a historic track, isn't it? The, the home of motorsport. What makes this place so special? I think a lot of things, to be honest. But for me, the biggest one has to be the fans. I think everyone talks about the Tifosi in Italy and also like in F1, Max Verstappen has his Dutch fans or when he goes over to Belgium as well. But the British fans just take motorsport into the heart and will support drivers up and down the grid, whether you're at the front or at the back. And it'll be exciting as well because we'll have full capacity there, sellout crowds. Obviously, F1 will have their sprint race um, format as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that compares to how F2 operates. But I think just the whole weekend, Silverstone last time around with the double header and having the 70th anniversary there, it was great. But it just missed that atmosphere that I think defines that circuit so well. And also, I think you can't underestimate how good of a circuit Silverstone is. It provides a lot of challenges. I'm a big fan of kind of going through Stowe or even some things like just looking at the track in general. It's such a brilliant layout for racing and provides a lot of challenges for the drivers to manage. And I think it'll be interesting to see whether some of the experienced drivers, how they manage it and whether it catches out some of the newer drivers, because there's a couple of them that haven't either raced at Silverstone at all or have had a little bit of a while away from it. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. Now, we've got our own track guide of Silverstone. I sat down with Luke earlier on in the week to uh, kind of go into the circuit with a little bit more detail. If you guys at home want to check that out, head over to our YouTube channel and it is on there. Jack, obviously, you've got, you know, you had two podiums around here last season, which, you know, isn't, isn't bad, I suppose. Um, it's very, very, very impressive. Uh, what are the secrets to putting a, a, a good lap together around here? I'm not putting that out in public. <laughs> <laughs> it's all staying up there. No, I think uh, Silverstone is um, a track that requires a lot of confidence with all the high speed sections, not necessarily because it's a scary place to, to go because you've got quite a lot of runoff these days, um, more because, especially for the sequences like Maggots and Beckett's, um, 
and even Brooklyn's and Luffield, where you're you're going from one corner into the other, um, you have to be really precise and you have to get the timing of um, the driving very, very uh, spot on, basically, to really nail that, especially in quality. And um, yeah, you can only do that if you're really happy with the car and feeling comfortable um, and you can really commit to those breaking points, turning points, getting back on the throttle. So um, yeah just have to be conf uh, confident there's no more british answer than saying you have to be spot on <laughs> spot on yeah it's a good way to say it isn't it <laughs> jack have you got a uh, have you got a favorite part of the track of yours or oh that's a hard one um i've got a few i mean i really like uh brooklyn's because you've got the brdc clubhouse on your right as you approach and a lot of the time um, there's a lot of friends and family watching from there. Um, you've got the big British flag and you've got the big grandstands right in front of you as well. And you can usually do some good overtaking moves there as well. So it's a, it's a nice spot. Uh, but then it's hard, hard to beat cops and uh, flying into maggots and beckets just because um, it's so, so fast. And in the car like an F2, you, you really get a good sensation of speed. Um, Jim Guan Yu Zhou, uh, one of the few drivers on the grid that actually has, you know, more than a few seasons of worth of experience right, uh, around this track and at this level, as you know, same as Jack. Um, can he use that experience at a circuit like this to cement his championship lead? He has to if he wants to have a real championship fight. Like I said, it's going to be uh, his time that he needs to clench his fist on going forwards with it. And Silverstone's a really a track that you know so many drivers have affinity with just because of how important it is in in motorsport particularly the british teams and joe spent a lot of time in the uk uh and naturally you're gonna spend a lot of time at silverstone because of that so it yeah i expect him to go out but i think i think jack's got the really good point of just you can go and get into that top 10 bubble and that's a safe thing. And we see that over and over. And I know Hannah, you do a lot of Formula E and just scoring points consistently through the season is the key to winning the championship. We saw last year with Schumacher, it wasn't going out and getting wins every time out to try and get the championships, just scoring points. So Joe just needs to not get into much, much difficulty in the reverse grid race because that could really upset his entire weekend. I think uh, I think Jack also has a good point with the amount of runoff, which could really be beneficial. Um, that after the street circuits we've had and more street circuits upcoming, and I'll, yeah, I'll say Sochi is one of those as well, that this could be a bit more of a forgiving race. So we might see some different type of racing from Joe and the other drivers, just because they've got a bit more runoff, which could be really exciting to see. We saw, was it uh, Marcus last time out? Had a bit of difficulty into turn three, I think it was at Baku. And it just had a difficult weekend because of that that sort of issue, um, trying to get three abreast going into, into, a, into a, uh, a 90 degree corner. It's not so big a deal at Silverstone because there is runoff. Um, was it last, no, two years ago when we saw Leclerc and Verstappen going, uh, where were they? The last corner and they were going absolutely hammer and tongs at it. And you can run wide and you can go on the tarmac and then you can fight back. That's the sort of stuff we like to see. And as many, as many times people say you like to see unforgiving tracks, I do like to see cars continue on and recover points, especially Formula 2. You can have a safety car at some point. So closes the field up and then you get to see the drivers uh, racing again. So it could be a, it could be a good time for Joe to put his foot down and uh, try and get a win, but I don't think he has to. It's a good, it's a good point. You mentioned that, you know, obviously there's, there's four street circuits on the, on the calendar this season. And it is, you know, we, we've just come off the back of Monaco and Baku where there isn't much runoff. So it's really nice to have a bit of runoff in there uh, so that drivers can actually battle and not have to worry about, Oh, if I go wide, then uh, that's race over. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of this calendar, and you know, after speaking to some Formula Two and Formula Three drivers as well, and Jack might have an opinion on this. The Formula Three calendar certainly seemed to be a little bit more traditional focused and a bit more popular. Uh, we have to wait and see to see how Saudi Arabia turns out. It might be the best track in the world. We don't know, uh, but yeah, it, 
the unfortunate nature of this move to a reduced number of weekends is that you are going to have to lose some tracks. And I would like to see a Formula 2 calendar, let's see a Formula 2, Formula 3, all the support series calendars have a bit more of a split between the street circuits and the traditional, let's call them traditional circuits. So it's a shame that we are so street circuit focused, I think this time around, I'd be quite curious to see if there's any feedback for next year uh, to see what the calendar will be then. But I'm really glad that Silverstone's come around and right at a good time as well, at middle of the season, the most traditional tracks you're going to get in the sport. So I'm really excited to see the, the drivers back at a traditional circuit. Uh, it seems like such a long time ago that the Formula 2 drivers would have seen grass. It, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, you know, in Austria, it was a bit weird seeing the Formula 3 guys there and not the Formula 2 guys, wasn't it? We're mm. so used to seeing the Formula 2 guys in Austria, so that was a shame. Uh, Hannah, obviously, Robert Schwartzman, had, he had a couple, a difficult couple of weekends last year in Silverstone. Had a 13th place finish, a 14th place finish, an 8th place finish, and then another 13th place finish, albeit uh, one of those races was obviously battling for the lead with Mick Schumacher, his teammate, uh, and things didn't quite go the way that they probably thought uh, or hoped that they were going to. Is that going to be on his mind this weekend? I think to some degree it will be. I think there's always going to be an element of looking back at what happened last time and maybe taking the lessons from it. I feel like if him and Piastri got into a similar battle, hopefully for both of them, it wouldn't end the same way. I think looking at the pace the Prem has had, I think he's he's actually done pretty well at Silverstone in the past. So in 2019 in F3, he got a fifth place and a second place finish. He can do well at that track. It was just unfortunate that both Premiers seemed to have a drop off in pace. Um, For him, it probably did end up being kind of the nail in the coffin for his championship campaign because you can't afford to have two consecutive underperforming weekends. But for him going into it now, he can take what he's learned from those weekends and think actually, no, the Premier's got the pace. I know I can do it. And I think he'll be very much determined to get on the podium to maybe prove some people wrong that maybe think this is his weak spot and hopefully get continue to get his championship campaign underway and jump up his teammate. He's third in the right. standings. He's got just as good of a shot as he did last time around. And I think for him, if he can jump Oscar, if he can get himself to the top of the standings after Silverstone, it would do wonders for the rest of his championship battle because we've all seen how easily it can turn around in the blink of an eye. Yeah, exactly. And Jim, another Brit that we've spoken about, obviously Dan Tictum, uh, we speak about him regularly on the show. Can he go on, you know, this weekend and, you know, he, you know, he won won the race last year with Dan's sprint race uh, with Dams last year. Can He's got the home advantage, home fans around him as well. It, you know, is this a chance for him to do well? Yeah, well, every race, of course, is a chance for him to do well. And he's he's been a really good package this year, I think. He's, uh, he's shown... We mentioned the maturity and everything. I think every time we've mentioned him um, on the podcast, and I'm not going to be surprised if he does win a race. Uh, he's certainly showing the speed, and we saw the overtakes he was performing last time out. That he's got the confidence as well. I think going into into the team, and I don't want to be mean about it, but showing up his teammate so soon um, is a real stamp of authority. And I wanted to briefly mention what. Hannah was speaking about with Schwartz. I think, forget the Silverstone curse for Schwartz, but I think he wants to really show that Piastri is the Formula 3 driver who needs to calm down and I'm here and it's my turn to win the championship with Prem and not yours. Uh, so, yeah, um, with Tictum, home fans, full house, it could really be a terrific... Be, let's, let's say with Lewis Hamilton as well and the amount of British drivers with Chadwick we've got in W Series. He's all these drivers and Jack of course yourself all these drivers at Silverstone this weekend it could be a really really good showing for the British fans who a lot of them Hannah not included might be looking to uh, make themselves feel a bit better after the football so yeah Formula One Formula Two and W Series is coming home and we could see the British flag on the top step of the podium um, several times across the weekend ticked them included. Jim, I thought we weren't talking about the football anymore. I'm, I'm still, still struggling to get over it. Um, Jack, can you, can you hear the fans from the, from the cockpit, or is that something that you know you're just so focused on the race that you don't really realise it until being that? It's pretty hard to beat a uh, Formula Two engine, but uh, sometimes you can. Like um, when I won there in 2019, I, I could see all the fans, uh, but I didn't hear them until the cool down lap after the checkered flag when 
obviously you're not going full speed anymore. The engine noise is a bit lower. And then I actually could hear them, which was really, really cool. Um, but it's it's a rare occasion. Yeah. Does does that inspire you? If if you can see them, for example, you can hear them if you if you make a move, for example, and you you know you really hear them erupt. Does that inspire you a little bit, or is that do you, again are you, are you so focused that you don't, you don't really think about it? Definitely, there's a little bit of uh, extra motivation when it's your home race because. Um, you know, you, you, you just want to, to go for broke a little bit more, I think. Um, it's a special thing to, to win at your home race and because of the way it is now in F2, especially with the feature race being on Sunday, um, you know, to win the feature race on, on Grand Prix Day uh, for the British Grand Prix weekend, that's going to be a pretty big thing for people to aim for. Um, so, yeah, it does. As Jim says, hopefully we can have some British success this weekend. And uh, Jack, hopefully, uh, hey, a win would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Jack, have you, um, sorry to go with a question here, but have you gone at, to Silverstone as a fan before you got into racing as well? And do you find the corners, while well, we're talking about Silverstone, right? do you find some of the corners you enjoyed watching trackside are completely different when you're actually in the car? Well, I went um, to Silverstone when I was like seven, I think, or even it must no, it must have been younger because I wasn't even uh, racing carts at that stage. Um, I think, yeah, six or seven years old, and I went to watch at Brooklands and Luffield, and um, I just remember walking up to the grandstand, and this was in the like B10 era, mm. um, and before you could even see the cars the ground was like shaking and the noise was vibrating through your body because it was such a, uh, such a powerful sound. Um, and then when I remember, the only thing I really remember from the race is that I missed the one big piece of action, um, which was, I think, Yano Trulli. I, I think it was Trulli, um, but like barrel rolling his Renault coming out of um, the... Um, Bridge. just before Brooklyn's out bridge so yeah that's right um so I don't know I didn't have much of an impression of the circuit as an expert back then but uh, for sure it, it probably is different because like my parents when they watch from home they always say oh I don't recognize the circuit at all because it looks so different on tv compared to when we're at the track so I, I think it probably is a bit different <laughs> it's changed a lot since those bridge days so I, I remember that as well that was a uh... Do you, do you actually, would you like to have driven that configuration or was it always been? Yeah, scary? definitely. I, the first time I drove Silverstone was pretty much the, the year straight after they finished the renovation. So I just missed it. Um, but obviously, you know, it's still there and I, I walk around it um, sometimes on the Grand Prix weekend because it's just like a bit of history pre preserved in tarmac. And now you've just got like people sitting around on it, having beers or whatever. It's, it's kind of cool, but also kind of sad. I, I went in 2018 was the last time I went and I was sat on it. Yeah, watching. And you're right, it is a little bit sad, isn't it? Because you think there's so much history there. Mm. But at the same time, it's, you know, the, the new configuration is good as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, MotoGP, for ruining that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, obviously, this is the first track this season that Formula 3 raced at last season, as well as, obviously, Formula 2 uh, this season. Obviously, Bahrain, uh, Monaco and Baku, Formula 3 weren't racing at last season. Uh, drivers such as Oscar Piastri, Terry Pocher, Liam Lawson, it's the first time that they're going to be racing at a circuit, um, you know, that they, that they were racing at uh, last season. Is that, you know, is, is that going to give them an advantage, Hannah? Do you think they'll be a little bit calmer, knowing that they've done well at this track last season? I wouldn't say necessarily gives them an advantage given kind of the jump up between the F2 and F3 cars, but I think it certainly gives them a level of confidence that, that it'd be less of an unknown. And say, for example, someone like Piastri, you've got to have confidence heading into the weekend, obviously, given how well the season's gone. And then getting on the podium last time in F3 and then European, or in Formula Renault Euro in 2019, he won both races there. So he knows that track pretty much like the back of his hand. And I think having that kind of experience and knowledge will ultimately help them. I think it may be a little out an opportunity for, I think, like to Piastri and Lawson and Pochere, given that they've been up the front for most of the season, will probably still continue to be up front. But maybe for some of those drivers, 
that have gone more towards the midfield that are still kind of getting to grips with them, it will give them a bit of a boost. And I think that level of knowledge will only help them, maybe help them get to grips a little bit easier, obviously, given the limited running that they have in practice. It's not going to be as big of the learning curve than they previously would have had, say, for example, in Monaco. So it'll be exciting to see. I think we'll possibly have a couple of the rookies on the podium because of it, because I can't see, as Jim mentioned, obviously, with a lot of them, with having a traditional circuit, you're going to have a lot of them going for incredibly gutsy moves. I think some probably will pay off and some won't. So it'll be interesting. And I'm curious to see which drivers maybe are willing to take the risks that they weren't necessarily as willing to take elsewhere. Yeah, Teo Porcher might be one of the drivers we obviously already mentioned that he uh, obviously hurt his wrist in in, in Baku, uh, but he's been cleared fit to race this weekend. Uh, that's great news for his title hopes, isn't it, Jim? And, and I suppose with the new format, that's something that, you know, if you do miss a race through, whether that be injury, or from, from, you know, thankfully we don't see that very often, um, or even COVID this year, you know, if, if you miss a race because you've tested positive or come into contact with someone, it's going to hurt more this year than in the previous years with free races. Yeah, it's it's huge. Um, it's, again, it's the luck of the draw as it could work out for some of the drivers who struggled in Monaco and, we saw, um, I think it was Armstrong again, talking about bad luck, wasn't it? Who had his pole taken away from him by virtue of uh, some engine issues and his whole weekend screwed up by that. So yeah, it, it could be huge. I don't know, Porsche is clearly a talent and I'm sure if you speak to, to some of the French, he's a second coming of Jesus, but I don't know if this year is going to be his championship year, in all honesty. Um, the thing that impresses me the most with Theo is I saw his Instagram saying he just finished school after winning. <laughs> so that's uh, that makes you feel a little bit old, doesn't it? So yeah, maybe maybe we'll see him completely concentrating now. He doesn't have to think about school so much. Uh, and I think he's got his driving test out of the way or something as well. Or something ridiculous. But yeah, I, I don't know. I don't. I think we could see him score a few more wins this year, um, reverse grid or otherwise. I don't know if we're going to see him go for the championship, he'll go for it. I don't know if we'll see him take the championship. I don't think we need to see him take the championship. He's He's got the backing behind him and he's got enough of a reputation that he's doesn't need to. And I think to a certain extent, all, all the drivers will want to win the championship. Of course they will. But I think for a certain extent, Piastri is the same, that it doesn't have to be his year this year. With Joe, with Schwartzman, um, potentially, I think if those guys are going to impress uh, the hand that feeds, then yeah, they really need to uh, take it up a notch and go for the championship. But for Porsche, take another couple of wins this year, finish sixth in the championship, win it next year. Maybe that's that's the route he can do to get to F1. And I think I think the way that the, the programs are lining up and uh, as Jack is probably aware, getting into Formula One, you have to have these academies backing you as the current world seems to be uh, I think Porsche is in a pretty good place to actually when if he wins the championship next year it could be quite a, could be quite a good timing for him yeah and it's really interesting how different drivers you know I, I suppose it is a case of timing isn't it and different drivers maybe have an extra year to um, kind of you know uh, for things to fall into place for them I was speaking to Liam Lawson yesterday at the Festival of Speed and he was saying that for every time uh, you don't win the championship or, or get promoted straight from Formula 2 into Formula 1. Every year that you spend in Formula 2 gets a little bit more difficult to make it to Formula 2. Is that something that you're kind of conscious of, uh, Jack, you know, when you're, um, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're I suppose, thinking about the future or, or do, you, do you always know you've got, you know, a few years to prove yourself and if it happens, it happens? I think it depends on the team a little bit. Um, certainly, you know, in Liam's situation, I would feel the same, uh, given Red Bull's track history. And um, I think that's probably the more common approach. You know, momentum is really important and uh, timing that momentum right is is also important. So um, you never want to be sat around in a series for too long if you're not getting results. Um, you know, that was part of the reason why um, we didn't want to go back and do another year of Formula 2, even though I am now racing there. Um, we didn't want to do another full season because we didn't have the budget to do it with a proper team um, at the front of the grid. And you're just going to hurt yourself if you go in not fully prepared. So um, I definitely sympathise with that. On the other hand, I think there is a bit of a recognition um, 
from some teams, including Williams, that age is, is a number. Um, that goes both ways. So, you know, you know, you can't be too young and you can't be too old. It's just how good you are. Um, so it's a balance. You know, in the ideal world, you would do F3, F2, F1, winning every time. Uh, but it's never as simple as that, I think. How, how supportive have Williams been, obviously, with your career? You've been with him for a, for a couple of years now. Uh, obviously, drove, drove in Sakir, which was, which was amazing. Uh, you know, how supportive have they been? Yeah, they've been very supportive. It's um, been quite a consistent trait since I joined. They were very keen to have me on board in the first place. And um, when the opportunity came up at the end of last year, um, they, you know, a lot of teams have reserved drivers, which are not really considered as uh, true replacements should the, the need come. Um, but they were more than happy to put me in the car and put faith in me to deliver a result, which is very nice to see. And um, again, coming into this year, when I said, you know, we, we probably can't do F2, but I'll be doing GT. and I still want to um, do what I can to help the team and prove that I'm, I'm worthy of a seat if, if that comes up. Um, and they were more than happy to see me do GTs and do something different, uh, learn some new skills. And, um, you know, hopefully I'll get out in the car for an FP1 later this year and give, they'll give me a chance there to show what I can do. Um, so it's, it's a very open and very um, supportive environment. Yeah, cool. OK, so as a platform that is all about our fans, uh, we want to give you guys the opportunity, as always, to ask any questions that you have ahead of this weekend. And you won't be surprised to know that uh, all of the questions have been aimed at you, Jack. Um, so uh, we've got Ryan Swartz on Twitter. Uh, has asked a, he's asked a couple of questions, actually. So his first thing he asked was, uh, if you could change one thing about Formula 2, what would it be? Uh, and the second question is, because of fuel and site... Uh, fuel saving and tire management, et cetera. What percentage are you actually pushing the car at during a race? Okay, two very good questions. Um, what would I change? That's quite a, a loaded question. <laughs> um, I think if I was going to do a simple change, a quick change, I, I don't necessarily completely favour the new format that we've gone with this year. <laughs> Sorry, this year. Um, partly because of what I mentioned earlier about if you're a championship contender or if you're one of the better drivers with better teams um, I don't think the system really rewards that which is a bit you know and I don't think that we get a lot out of the entertainment side from that um, you know, it's always a balance that's why we have reverse grid races in the first place and Formula 3 and Formula 2 have great uh, popularity partly because of that I think the second sprint race is a bit much um, personally and the reduced number of rounds that you get from that is also not great because the drivers don't get to experience as much um, in the longer term and probably the less attainable thing I'd change is its cost I think um, you know it would always be great to see costs coming down I know especially Formula 3 recently costs have gone up um, without really clear reasons why um, other than a lack of competition, <laughs> really. Um, so, um, and Formula 2 could, could always be doing more, I think, for that. So that would be nice. Um, and then the second question was about fuel saving, tyre saving, et cetera. Um, there isn't really any fuel saving in Formula 2. Um, at least I've never had to do it. Maybe if uh, some calculations have been done wrong and you get a panicked radio message, um, you have to, but... It's, it's very, very rare and exceptional if you have to do that. Uh, tire saving is, on the other hand, a big part of the, the game. Um, as we know, Pirelli tires, to get the best out of them, you do have to baby them a little bit, um, especially some of the faster tracks like Silverstone, the front left tire in particular gets absolutely ragged. Um, so you have to take care of that. I think it was Lungard who... He had a, a straight up puncture because he was just, um, I'm sure there were other circumstances as well, but it, it looked like it because he was pushing it quite hard, maybe had a lock up as well. Um, but it changes track to track, weekend to weekend. So I can't give you a full answer on that, but on average, um, you know, maybe you're at nine out of 10 um, in the race rather than a 10 out of 10. 
he'll push in hard. You guys wouldn't get out of the car sweating if he wasn't pushing right. So yeah, it's got to be <laughs> yeah, even when you're driving at nine out of ten, that doesn't mean uh, a nine out of ten on effort. It's uh, it's still hard work. <laughs> and. At Tommy Carroll on Twitter asks, uh, obviously, when Formula 2 is a spec series, it's a lot easier, uh, sorry, is it a lot easier to hop straight back into the car after some time away? Obviously, you, you spent a bit of time, well, I suppose it was only one round in the end away. Um, and do the characteristics remain, you know, relatively the same? Yes. I mean, uh, when I jumped into the HWA car in Monaco, for example, it only took a couple of laps to feel like I was back at home a little bit um so you know there is definitely a limited amount that you can do from team to team on the other hand when you're talking about tenths of a second uh those limited things become very very important and clearly some teams do it better than others and um there's a lot of uh resource being pushed now i think formula two teams are increasingly becoming mini formula one teams which is also part of the reason why costs are going up I mean, I know some teams have ops rooms uh, where they have engineers stationed remotely uh, away from the track to digest data and uh, help the team where they can. And obviously that requires manpower and, and uh, a place to put them. And um, it's, it's becoming very, very, uh, uh, a bit more of a technical battleground as the years go on. So um, there are differences for sure. And Luke underscore Buckle 12 on Instagram asks, how important is trail breaking when racing? Uh, and secondly, uh, how was it? We've covered this slightly, but how was it racing? Obviously, the Sakir Grand Prix last year. Trail breaking is very important. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a difficult question because that's like asking, because um, trail breaking is just something you do nearly all the time. I know... Uh, if you go to the kart track or you do a uh, course with an instructor at a track, they talk about trail braking as if it's quite a specific skill, uh, which it is. And every driver has to learn it. Um, but every corner to a degree requires trail braking. It's just that some need it more. Brooklyn's needs a hell of a lot because you're doing the braking and, and entry for a really long time and you need to manipulate the car for a long time there. Whereas um, the um, club chicane going like the last corner, um, it's a straight braking zone and then you turn in. And there's a very, very small period of time where you're going to trail brake, but it is there. Um, so it's a bit like, you know, uh, I don't know, it's like saying how important is ankle rotation and walking. I mean, <laughs> it's very important, I guess, because you have to do it all the time, but it's not the, the be all and end all. Cool. And uh, Jim, I think you have a question for Jack. Is that right? I've got a couple if, uh, if you'd be so kind, Fraser. But yeah, uh, Williams, your reserve driver there, and they called upon you, um, I presume with the super license points because they've got a, a growing roster of drivers there. And that was great. But so you've been there for a couple of years. And what's it like now with the takeover? How has it changed day to day for you? Uh, not a lot has changed day to day. Obviously, um, the people in management have changed. So, you know, uh, I joined the team when it was still family run, which in itself was pretty great to see and to at least uh, take in that bit of history, I guess, because uh, I'm not sure if we'll ever see something like that again in Formula One. Um, yeah, probably, probably at some point but um, now we have uh, Jost there and Doralton um, and they're doing a pretty great job changes are being made slowly uh, but not without quite a lot of consideration um, and it's all coming from a, from a good place so um, there are quite a few new faces in the factory uh, when I go around and it's difficult to keep up with the, the new hires sometimes but it's good you know the team's growing and uh, I think people are quite quite happy about it, to be honest. That's great. I'll, um, I'm really hoping Williams go further, of course. Uh, and the second question is actually tied to, I guess, your your mixed heritage, that you've got the Korean element, you've got uh, an English element, and then you've got Tartan. English. Yeah, well, well, this, is, this is what I wanted to speak to you about, actually. You've got Tartan. I'm very careful. Here. My dad's going to be <laughs> 
<laughs> but you were born in London and then you've got the yeah. Scottish element, you've got the South Korean. Yeah, so how has that impacted on you with how, I don't know, even finding sponsors? Is that something you you, you consider? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, um, for those who don't know, my dad is Scottish, my mum is South Korean. I am probably best described as English, even though I would never describe myself as that. <laughs> because, <laughs> Um, that, that wouldn't go down well. Uh, I describe myself as British, but uh, for sure it's uh, it's something that uh, drivers before me have done before, have done um, f- trying to find sponsors um, using their heritage, um, especially if it's from countries that offer more marketing potential than where they were born. Uh, so for me, that usually means South Korea, but it can also mean Scotland. You know, we've been in uh, talks with, companies from both regions and uh, I've even had sponsorship from some so it's something that we're always trying to uh, work on and you know making the jump to Formula One of course you have to have the talent um, or at least some Um, but it helps if you can bring some sponsorship to the team and to show that you're a marketable person as well so um, definitely that's something that we we work on. I saw David Coulthard of course in Williams so you never know exactly yeah <laughs> just have to work on my scottish accent it's not it's not great <laughs> <laughs> i lived in scotland too so you're uh, you're just the same as me <laughs> <laughs> and hannah did you have a question yeah so obviously it was great to see you make your formula one debut in sack air i wanted to know whether any lessons you took from formula two into your f1 debut and any lessons you've now taken back from that debut to formula two uh that's quite a hard one because I think nowadays the gap between Formula 2 and Formula 1 is massive um, they're almost uh, like, to call it a feeder series is, is stretching it I think because in Formula 1 you're answering to um, a team of you know, 20 or 30 trackside engineers in F2 you have one or maybe two if uh, you're lucky um, you have six or seven mechanics per car in F1 to make you comfortable and to get things right. You have one, again, one or two in F2. And then the biggest difference is you've got a, a team in total of five or 600 people um, versus a team of 12 in F2. Um, and you have a lot more track time in F1, a lot more data, uh, information uh, rich as, as a environment where F2 is the complete opposite. You know, we, we're not allow, allowed to run a lot of sensors. We're not allowed to have too much uh, manpower, even though people are trying to find ways around that. Um, so it's very difficult to, to draw um, similarities between the two, apart from the driving, uh, which is quite quite an obvious one. Um, so going into the F1 round at Sakir, to be honest, most of the stuff that I was drawing on was my previous experience in F1 cars uh, from testing and doing the FP1 session earlier that year with, with Williams. Um, and I learned a lot uh, during that weekend. Coming back to F2, um, I think, again, it's the same problem. It's very difficult to bring back ideas because a lot of the things that you think about and work on in F1, um, if you try to bring that to an F2 environment, um, you either don't have the data to be able to analyze those things in that much detail, or you don't have the track time to test the things you want to do, or you don't have the tires. Um, we're just really, really limited in F2 compared to F1. For sure, there are things that um, I take confidence from having done that weekend, knowing that I can do certain things well and other things not, not so well, and where I can improve because you have a lot more people critiquing you. Um, and that's something that I've brought back to my driving on all counts. But um, yeah, it's a tough one. Are there any exclusives you want to give us, Jack? Any uh, news on when you'll be announced at Williams? Is that when Jordan <laughs> Russell goes to Mercedes? Or uh... no exclusives? No, that's all the work in progress. Um, but, yeah, but if we'll you do find out, we'll, we'll be the first ones to know, right? Obviously, yeah. I've got you on uh, speed dial, so it's all good. Perfect, guys. You've got it, got it there from Jack. There you go. Uh, what, what are your expectations for this weekend? Are points uh, realistic in terms of targets? Is it a podium? How's this weekend looking? I don't really know. Um, I would like definitely like to get some points because I feel like we deserved them last time out. 
and didn't get them. Um, and it feels a bit crap having a, a big fat zero next to my name, even if I've not been here the whole year. So got to fix that. Um, and if I could get on the podium, that would be pretty pretty awesome at my home event. Um, and I'm not discounting that as a possibility because I think the team are capable of making some big steps with the car and I'm getting more and more comfortable with them as well. Um, so yeah, I just have to qualify in the top 10 and then anything can happen. So it's all good. And is this going to, I don't know whether you can say this or not, but is this going to be your last weekend in Formula 2 or uh, is that unknown at the moment? You're just going to see what happens. So it's it's unknown. I mean, I'm not inclined to, to do the whole season with HWA and they're not inclined either because um, this is not a, a long-term solution for them. They need a driver who can come and bring budget and and give them a full season because I have... Uh, clashes later in the year anyway with the calendar um, as I wasn't planning on doing it um, so we're doing it race by race at the moment uh, they will obviously ask me to come back for Silverstone we'll reassess afterwards and I kind of hope that um, they can get a proper solution in place <laughs> Well, Jack, you know, thank you so much for joining us on the show today uh, and for your brilliant insight. We're definitely wishing you the best of luck. And I'm sure we speak from behalf of the motorsport community. Uh, wishing you luck this weekend, hopefully points or even a podium. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, so best of luck for that. Jim, Hannah, thank you for joining us as always. Uh, we will, of course, be back uh, next week to review all of the action off the back of round four. So keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, you can either get involved in the conversation on Discord or you can uh, of course getting them involved in the conversation on social media if you enjoyed the show please make sure you hit the like button subscribe and leave any comments you have of, uh, about this video in the comments section but from me fraser ford and all of us here at inside f2 we'll see you next time